Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, can you hear me and can you see me? We can do both. Okay, excellent. Thank you for the invitation uh, to present genital urinary infections, which I must say is a primary health care uh, approach in terms of how we need to treat these patients. And ultimately, it would get to a point where they need to be referred through to the gynecological department. But Jared didn't specify if he wanted male or female, so I've tried my best to try and incorporate the both. And if there's any comments regarding male STIs or UTI infections, please, uh, kindly, we can discuss it after the presentation. So moving on, genital urinary medicine deals with male and female genital and urinary tract infections. And this overlaps quite a bit, but it is different because of anatomy as well as physiology. So in the female, we get urinary tract infections. Oh, Most okay. of our, sorry. Some of our patients may present to us with recurrent UTIs, and we often see it in patients who have structural abnormalities and in pregnant women, vaginosis and cervicitis. And dealing with the reproductive organs, we often have to uh, manage patients who present to us with endometritis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and those that actually present with infertility as a subset of the infection. When we look at male patients, urethritis, epididymitis, prostitis can also lead to erectile dysfunction as well as infertility and enlarged prostate and elevated PSA levels. And so the common um, regards between males and females would be urinary tract infections, but we often see the couples coming in with uh, elements of infertility. So this group or subset of patients have delayed health seeking and this is because most often genital urinary infections are sexually transmitted. And in most communities and in most cultures and generally the topic is taboo. And so often patients don't seek help to uh, rectify the problem because it's quite an intimate examination and quite an in-depth uh, clinical history that needs to be taken to evaluate the next step. And so the risk factors is that this can affect anybody, women are more prone to infections than men, and women in their reproductive age, because of not using barrier methods, can have an infection 30 to 1 times more compared to men. A lot of the risk factors can be associated with anatomical abnormalities, and then the immunocompromised group, those on medications, uh, for example, chemotherapy, disease processes like diabetes, patients who may have cancer, and pregnant women. So signs and symptoms are extremely important because where we are with these patients is that we have to have quite a bit of intuition to be able to determine what the problem is because it's such a sensitive topic. And so there's a lot of overlap in terms of the signs and symptoms that when uh, men and women will present with. For example, frequent scanty urination, pain or difficulty when urinating, weak or interrupted urination, a foul smelling urine, urgency, urinary retention, urinary splitting. And this means initially going to the bathroom, stopping and then having it happen again very uh, quickly, blood in the urine, lower abdominal discomfort and lower back pains. Specific to women is a vaginal discharge or a foul vaginal smell and itchiness or discomfort. And pertinent to men is a urethral discharge, elevated levels if they're being screened for um, an enlarged prostate and urethral discomfort. So complications also overlap between these two groups. And it's quite severe in the sense that it's a very debil debilitating disease process. And unless we can rectify and manage these patients accurately and early enough, there may be detrimental effects. So recurrent UTIs, kidney infections, cervical cancer, chronic prostatitis uh, in men, abnormal uterine bleeding, pelvic pain, and mainly reproductive concerns in the female like abortion, ectopic pregnancy, pelvic inflammatory disease, preterm labor, pre-rupture, um, of membranes, as well as teratogenesis in certain groups that were early in pregnancy, but presented with an infection and stillbirth, 
those are the common ones that we would see at a tertiary facility in high-risk pregnancies or in the high-risk gynecological patient. When it comes to the male, erectile dysfunction, infertility, and enlarged prostate, cancers, and pain syndromes are also very relevant. And most often patients accept this as a normality, but it is treatable. And the one common factor that goes across the board to anyone that experiences this disease process is depression, which is quite real in patients who are trying to start up a family or wanting to conceive. And if infection ultimately leads to a cancer, that is definitely something where we can come in as preventing it. So the common pathogens look at bacteria, which would be the most common, gram-negative organisms like E. coli, as well as many others, account for about 60 to 90% of infections, especially in immunocompromised groups. And we deal mainly with pregnant women, and it is quite pertinent when we look at urinary tract infections in the pregnant population. There's also gram-positive organisms that we find in patients who have kidney uh, compromise or those with chronic UTIs. So the pathogens are numerous. We, do, we can deal with bacteria, fungi, viruses, uh, protozoa, and um, terrible components that can be quite debilitating, for example, lice. And so it's a multi-organism approach that we need to be able to treat these patients with. The diagnosis can be quite varied or very specific if we're looking for certain causes. Um, often STI or a UTI, a urine dipsticks or urinalysis. We can look at pH or proteins or glucose or ketones, nitrates that are positive often tell us there's a bacterial infection. A urine MCNS is more diagnostic. Um, patients that present with hematuria or have a leukocytosis, cast epithelial cell crystals, not only give us information about an infective process, but about other inflammatory causes as well that will um, make it more urgent for us to upscale these patients to review for any components of cancers. Wet mounds, we can look for trichomonas, direct immunofluorescence for chlamydia infections, and then imaging in the view of ultrasound or CT scans if needed for anatomical abnormalities, obstructions, or to review abscesses. And that would be in an era where the primary healthcare facility would then send these patients across to the gynecological department for us to make these assessments. And so how do we then curtail to how do we prescribe for these patients? Because sometimes some of the investigations that we need may not be available in a facility or may take longer than we need for us to be able to treat these patients. And so it's a two core principle in terms of which we use a syndromic approach. And here partner tracing is extremely, extremely important. It's also very important to note that if at any stage a child needs to present with a genitourinary infection, it should be referred for further investigation so that these children are kept safely and we can rule out that there hasn't been any features of assault. Then we have the pregnant population in which a whole host of medication and antimicrobials that we would treat from a syndromic approach is not safe to be used in pregnancy. And so we try and stay away from the tetracyclines as well as the aminoglycosides because that can cause teratogenesis. And so there's a very nice guideline from the Department of Health. Um, it was published in 2018, and I see it has been updated in 2019, which I found extremely user-friendly because of the algorithms. And uh, I'm also willing to share the entire document uh, with Jared to send out to the team, because it is uh, free online, and I've already downloaded it, so you're welcome to that. And essentially, go, they go through the very basic process of what the causative organisms are leading to STI syndromes. For example, Neisseria gonorrhea, the chlamydia trichomonas, and they put it into the syndromes in which patients may present. So generally, we would have someone presenting with a lower abdominal pain. And as you start gaining the confidence of the patient and the morale, you would be able to then go into the fact that there is a discharge. It happened after an intimate uh, episode uh, with someone about a week ago, and then you start developing into which type of syndrome they would fall into. So VDS stands for the vaginal discharge syndrome. Then we look for the male urethritis syndrome. 
lower abdominal pain associated with the discharge, and then the genital ulcer syndrome. And I thought that they broke it down very nicely in terms of which patient presenting with which syndrome would fall into which group and then how you would manage them. So the syndromic approach generally is using keftriaxon, a dose of 250 milligrams IM stat, and this is accompanied by azithromycin that is one gram stat per us. They also recommend in um, females and in males that are sexually active, we should then uh, also add in the flagell. So generally in this group of patients, they would be getting the three drugs. If the UTI or if the um, genital unitary tract infection is still recurrent and they persist and they just go back to the clinic, metronidazole, promotrimoxazole, vaginal perseries, azithromycin at a higher dose if there is a penicillin allergy is then prescribed to the patient with the letter to attend the healthcare facility. Besides having discharges, there's also painless and painful ulcers that patients may present with. Often we like to do an ulcer scraping and send this off to the lab to be definitive. But in a primary healthcare setting and in a gynecological room, it's not always possible to do so. And so the common ones that we essentially try to treat would be our herpes, uh, chancroid, as well as syphilis and lymphogranuloma, venarium. It's also extremely important to always remember that if a patient is ever going to present with a genital urinary tract uh, infection or any type of syndrome, that we must always, always advocate that these patients are counseled and that they know that they are able to test for HIV. So when it comes to genital ulcers, doxycycline is given. In pregnant patients, because doxycycline can cause bone abnormalities as well as discoloration of bone and teeth in the fetus, we propagate for benzathine, benicillin. If it's not available, amoxicillin and probenicide can be used in these patients. If a patient presents with an ulcer and is also known to be HIV positive, acyclovir is also administered. And if it is persistent, then azithromycin is given to these patients. And if there's still no response, then they're referred to a facility with the specialist to be able to assist them. These are the treatment guidelines. If there's more than one STI syndrome, the circles in red are pertinent to female patients that we often see um, either in the casualty or that present to us um, in the GOPD. And most often they would get the same regimen, which would be the keftriaxon, the metronidazole, the azithromycin. If there are features to suggest an ulcer, a cyclover, if there are features to suggest a candidiasis, then they would also get a pursuit. So that's the broad spectrum syndromic approach that many uh, facilities outside of our setting would use. And if these patients have persistent infections, then they are then um, referred to us in order for us to investigate the next step. I wanted to include this cohort of patients, which is um, quite sad for us to be able to treat. Um, and it's quite traumatic, not only for the patient, but for the clinician as well. And we often have a cohort of patients that present to us after a sexual assault. And so we would like to also treat them to prevent any of these infections or ulcers that they may have been subjected to. And so for any patient that presents with an alleged sexual assault or is confirmed on clinical examination, we prescribe keftriaxone, azithromycin, doxycycline, and metronidazole. We also refer for HIV testing and for PPE, ARV prophylaxis, as well as emergency contraception to be holistic to treat these patients after the ordeal. And so that's one aspect of prescribing that we really need to also uh, be cognizant of. It doesn't need to be done by a gynecologist. A lot of these patients come via the trauma department and essentially they should be seen uh, by an MDT team to make sure that everything pertinent to them has been given. So the challenges, as many of you would know, has been the infection of gonorrhea, which has been present for many years. And as the years has evolved, essentially there has been quite a marked resistance in this type of bacteria. Previously, when the resistance was first evaluated, there was updates from the CDC to suggest that there needed to be a dual 
um, approach, and this was by giving kef trioxone together with azithromycin. The latest review that came through in 2020 looked at an update of the CDC's treatment guidelines, and what was established on those guidelines was that generally kef trioxone was given at 250 milligrams, and that the dose needed to be higher, and 500 milligrams as a single dose needed to administer without the azithromycin. When we look at UTIs, and I'm specifically going to bring on the pregnancy population, because that's what I uh, have the most experience with. And this is work from our own facility with my colleagues in microbiology. And I was very happy to be a part of this because it's actually enhanced on our clinical practice. And today itself, there were five patients that we were cheating for a UTI in the antenatal ward. And so the top three pathogens that we found amongst pregnant women were E. coli, Epicolis, and Klebs pneumonia. The susceptibility of E. coli was kefiroxine. However, it has declined over the years because there has been an extended spectrum beta lactamase rate that has increased. And so the most common antibiotics we found that we're going to benefit this cohort of patients in terms of pregnant women presenting with symptomatic or asymptomatic UTIs was nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin. Unfortunately, we don't have phosphomycin available to us. And so our patients receive nitrofurantoin. And from clinical experience, we've seen a remarkable um, uh, coherence with getting uh, clinically improving, with improving on urine PCRs that we send for patients who are preeclamptic. And the best part is that we don't need to house these patients as inpatients to give them the antibiotics. And that makes a huge difference in terms of them returning to their other children and us being able to manage these patients as our patients. So in conclusion, we need to know the population we're dealing with. We need to be able to risk profile our patients. We need to make sure that we prevent these infections by ongoing education and also by protecting certain groups that may be more vulnerable. So also taken from the DOH pamphlet, looked at the general principles that we need to, as a community and as healthcare professionals, to try and prevent genital urinary tract infections, counseling and education, including HIV testing wherever possible, condom promotion, provision, and demonstration to reduce the risk of STIs, compliance and adherence for treatment, contact treatment and partner management, circumcision promotion, counseling to continue condom use and cervical cancer screening. And I think that this is pertinent for everyone who deals with either a male or a female to try and prevent catastrophic events later on. And so essentially what we want to do in these patients is to stop the drop. And so your STD panel came back, but it turns out what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas and essentially stay cool. Keep patients being safe and keep yourself safe.